Trade Zone. The concept. Trade Zone feature is an optional on the ARM V8 M Co. Code running in secure state can access both secure and unsecure information. When enabled, the system by default starts up in secure state. When not enabled, the system is always in non-secure state. The division of secure and non-secure world is memory map and the transition takes place automatically without the need of secure monitor exception handler, though it's optimizing switching overhead. So in fact, it's an additional state in the Harm V8 Elm. We have the secure and non-secure states. System always starts in secure state when it's activated. The split of the secure and non-secure memory map is done secure attribution unit. So you should already know this split between the handler mode and the thread mode, and now it's duplicated in the secure world and the non-secure world. Other features, four stack and four stack pointer register. We've got the hardware stack limit checking. The memory space is partitioned into secure and non-secure spaces using programmable MPO-like security attribution unit, also called SIU, or fixed external security configuration. The exception handling hardware automatically save and then clear the secure register states when switching to the non-secure exception state. Non-secure entry to secure code restricted to secure code location containing in the secure gateway instruction and tag as a non-secure callable region. But I will give you detail on this aspect just after. We've got three different attributes in the SIU and EDIU. So EDIU is an implementation defined attribution unit, I will say by default on hardware, and the SIU is a secure attribution unit. It will be configured at the, uh, the code starts. So we could define three kinds of region. Secure, non-secure callable, and non-secure. So in a non-secure, we've got a non-secure application, and the non-secure application can't call anything directly to the secure. You have to call something in the non-secure callable region, and then we can branch from this region to the secure one and I have access to the secure. Then we return back to the non-secure or from the non-secure callable area directly to the non-secure. The non-secure programming calling of a secure function. For, from the non-secure world, you're just branching to the function that is in non-secure callable area. And the first instruction executed will be a, a security gate. Okay, secure gate, sorry. Then we will branch to the secure world. And once it's finished, we've got the branch for, to the non-secure world. Let's see now how we will configure this. So as I said, the EDIU is static. It defines the non-secure callable and the non-secure exempted region granularity of 64 megabit. SIU could define up to eight regions, and it's used to overwrite the EDIU in order to set secure area and confirm the non-secure one. So here, what is interesting is the alias non-secure and the alias secure. In fact, those both regions will address exactly the same physical memory, okay? But here we've got the non-secure alias and the secure alias. This will be really important, and we will see how we can access or not such kind of region. IDIU is static, and I will say defined by hardware or here at the boot time. Then you need to configure the SIU during the boot. So the IDIU say this region is non-secure, this one is non-secure or non-secure callable. Here we are in the alias secure. In the alias non-secure, it just says that it's non-secure code and non-secure. Then the idea you confirm that this one should be secure or non-secure callable, and this one is secure only. So we've got the non-secure callable here, the secure. Here the alias in the non-secure world, and the rest. Frankly speaking, it's not easy to understand, so I will try to explain you another way. Here I'll give you an extract from the reference manual of the L5. So it shows you the EDIU attribution by default and the SIU that is typically done. Then you've got the final attribution. What is interesting here, we can see the code flashed on the SRAM, which is 
I will say alias as secure address and non-secure address, sorry, and the secure address, okay? We've got the same thing for the external memory, the SRAM, the peripheral. So the configuration is not so easy to understand. Let's take an example. The objective is to have this physical memory with a secure area, then a non-secure callable area, and the non-secure area. So it is this, this configuration we want to achieve. So first we know this memory is alias in a non-secure and secure. And by default in the IDAE, you can see it in the previous array, the non-secure alias is non-secure with the IDAE. And the secure alias of the address is configured as non-secure callable, okay? Then we will configure the IDAE, so SAU, sorry. SAU by default, everything is insecure. So we just define which region will be overwrite with another write. So in the alias secure area, we will define a region to say this one is a non-secure callable area. So that means the region between C and C3E is secure. This one will be kept secure. And now to the non-secure alias, we will just say this region is not secure. And the result of this configuration is IDAU plus SAU is this one. So regarding the non-secure alias, this part is protected or secure. This one is non-secure. Here it's secure, non-secure callable, and then it was secure but it was our objective, a secure error. Let's see which range of address we need to use when we want to access each of these regions. So our physical area, physical memory alias, and then depending on the CPU state, we will see if we can access or not in the secure alias range or the non-secure alias range. Let's start with the secure alias range and let's try to access the secure area. If the CPU state is in the secure mode, I can access the secure area. If I'm in non-secure mode, I can't. Now, if we try to call the non-secure callable area from the secure alias range of address, the secure mode and the non-secure mode could access. So it's through this address that we can call the non-secure callable area from the non-secure code. Then if the secure mode, or in secure mode or in non-secure mode, through the secure range alias of address, we can't access this region, okay? If now we are talking about the non-secure alias range of address, in secure mode or non-secure mode, we can't access the secure area. We can't access neither the non-secure callable. Only the secure area could be accessed by the secure mode and the non-secure mode. I hope those uh, animation help you to understand what we will configure in the SAU, and after our, which range of address we need to use to access the different region. Trust zone activation. So it's done thanks an option by TDEN. Then the SAU configuration to be done at boot time. And during the hands-on after, I will show you where it's located in our project. We've got additional flash security feature available associated with trust zone. We've got the secure watermark-based user option byte defining the secure area and also HDP area. We've got a secure and non-secure block base area that could be configured on the fly after the reset. And then we've got an additional RDP protection, which is the RDP level 0.5. Let's detail, detail this difference feature. First, the secure watermark-based area protection. It's a part of the flash memory that can be protected against non-secure read and write access. So I will say additionally to the SAU, we will define a region in the flash that is secure only. 
to area could be configured thanks option byte. So you've got a start address and a hand address for each region. Those option byte could be only modified by a secure code and if a specific bit, HDPX this bit, is clear. When this bit is set, the option byte is locked and can't be modified until the next system reset. Let's talk now about the secure height protection, also called HDP. It's a kind of a secure mem. There is a previous chapter in this MOOC about the secure mem. So once this uh, area is closed, saying the X this bit, in the flash sec HDP uh, control register, this part of the code cannot be accessed anymore by any means until the next boot. The HDP is located at the start of the flash motor mark based secure area, the previous slide. Configure thanks to option byte, so HDP activation, and the end, the end page offset regarding the start of the watermark area. The option byte could be modified only if the HDP acts this bit is clear. When it is set, option byte are locked and cannot be modified until the next system reset. I propose a sum up of the both slides with an animation. I hope it will help you to fix the ID. So the watermark is an area with a start and hand address defined in secure option byte. It's where we will put our secure application or all the secure world. Then we will define thanks another option byte, so HDPN, the end of the HDP. So now the HDP is from this to this point. We also activated the HDP enable. Here we will put, I will say, our secure boot. And on the boot is over, then we will want this region to disappear completely. That means even in the secure world, we can't access it. So let's start the boot. We boot on the base address of the secure boot. Everything is going well. When we finish to execute the code in the secure HDP, we will call a exit secure procedure in the root security system. This one we write in the flash sec HDP control register and set this bit. Doing this, all this memory completely disappears from the system. That means the secure application that's go on can't access it anymore. Okay? So it's really the principle of the secure mem. Another feature is a secure block based area protection. Here you can create secure area dynamically. So it's configured things uh, registered in the flash, but it can be only accessed from the secure mode. Caution, when you're switching a page or a memory block from secure to non-secure, it does not erase the content. So you can create and um, remove secure area dynamically, but take care when you're doing this not to leave some information that could be used from the unsecure parts. LDP 0.5, non-secure debug only. So the debug access to the secure area is prohibited and the debug access to the non-secure area is still possible. So if you remember, just remove this part of the draw and you've got the RDP classical, I would say. From level zero, you can go to the level one. In this case, you can't use a bootloader anymore. You can't connect with the debugger, but it's like the flash. And if you do a regression from level one to level zero, there is a full mass error. If you are going to the level one to the level two, then you can't um, connect anymore. Uh, you can't modify option byte. I will say your device is fully locked. Okay, and okay, now we've got this additional step. So if we are in level zero and switch to level 0 0.5, what happened? We can't access the secure area. We can just connect and debug the non-secure area. Okay, and you can go from the level 0 0.5 to the level one. Here you've got the full protection. Regarding decreasing the level of the RDP, if you are switching from level 0 0.5 to 0, then you've got a full mass errors. That means all the region, the secure and the non-secure, have been erased. If you are switching from level 1 to level 0 0.5, you will just erase the non-secure part. Okay? 
So I would say the level 0.5 is a, a really a way to work with the secure part without any impact on the uh, non uh, to work on the non secure part without any impact on the secure one. The trade load inactivation. So it's just one option byte, but it's only possible on a RDP regression from level one to level zero. That means a full mass error of the chip. When the trust zone is deactivated after option byte loading, the following security features are deactivated. Watermark based secure area, block based secure area, RDP 0.5, the secure interrupt, and all secure registers are read as zero or write in your. GTZC, the Global Trust Zone Controller. It's composed of the Trust Zone Security Controller, which allow configuring the security attribute of peripheral that can be configured as secure or non-secure. It can also configure the external memory region through watermark memory protection controller. We also have the MPCBB. It's a block-based memory protection controller allow configuring the security attribute of the SRAM1 and SRAM2 block. And then with the TEDx, the Trust Zone Illegal Access Controller. It gathers a whole illegal access event in the system and generates a secure enter toward NVIC. Here you've got the schematics of the GTZC. Here we've got the Trust Zone Security Controller. We'll, I will check the access of the peripheral. As you can see, it can check also the external memory the securable peripheral, and also the master on the bus. Then we've got the MPCBB. We will uh, we'll say configure the block of the internal SRAM as secure or non-secure. And the TEDx that should gather any violation um, event and go through the NVIC to generate an interrupt. When the trust zone security is active, a peripheral can be either securable or trust zone aware. Securable, that means its security attribute is configured by the GTZC TZS security controller. If it's trust zone aware, its security attribute is configured using some peripheral secure register. For example, for the GPIO, it's a trust zone aware. So there is a specific register inside the GPIO to configure if it's a secure word or not the secure. Here you can have the list of the trust zone aware peripheral and the remaining peripheral are securable. So I invite you to have a look in the reference manual of the chip that you are using to confirm this information. The availability of the trust zone over STM32 series, today we still we only have it on the L5 with the Cortex M33. Some reference. A really interesting application note about uh, the trust zone feature and the reference manuals that are available today. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>